go there right now, but I'll just mention one quick thing, and then we can maybe circle back around tonight or tomorrow night. But uh, yeah, I think in situations like that, so often having raised kids, even a couple daughters through the teen years, it's like, how can God's word help me help them, which is important, but let's not miss that the word of God helps us. So how does the gospel shape Veronica, your heart, your words, your actions toward those teenage daughters when they're being drama queens? <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 That's good. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Let me tell you a quick story, and then um, I'll introduce all three evenings together here. But it's been a number of years now, but I can still remember this one man in our church. He showed up in my my study, and um, he sat down, and he just started crying. And he was crying so hard he couldn't talk. And this went on for a while, to the point that it was awkward. But um, I didn't try to force the issue. I just sat and tried to show compassion to my friend who was just weeping. And uh, it took a long time for him to find his voice. But he finally got his voice and he said, Larry he said, I taught my son how to play ball, but I never taught my son how to love Jesus. I can remember it as clear as day. I taught my son how to play ball, but I never taught my son to love Jesus. And when he said that, his 18-year-old son was sitting in the county jail with no interest in Christ. And I knew his son, too. He grew up in our church. Um, and my heart broke for my friend you know, that he felt despair. He felt like he had wasted 18 years. Uh, his son was actually very athletic, good ball player, um, but had no interest in Christ. And the dad hadn't been concerned about that. He was celebrating his son's athletic successes, as if that's what really mattered in our little town. <clears throat> So we talked about where do we go from here, um, just so you can have some hope. That son professed faith in Christ in the jail through the chaplain's ministry there. And um, he's out now, but his life was messed up through all that too. But anyway, I thought about that father who said, I taught my son to play ball, but I never taught him how to love Jesus. We have so much time with our kids. We have so much time with our grandkids. Now, Lord willing, that relationship will continue on into their adult years, but functionally, practically speaking, we have a limited, limited amount of time to truly impact our kids and even our grandkids with the gospel. How do we do that? How do we do that? <clears throat> um, any of you folks looking forward to the Olympics this summer? Yeah, a few of you. I, I like watching the Olympics. I, as my son tells me, my 40-year-old son, he says, Dad, view athleticism as a distant memory. He has a gift of encouragement. <laughs> but uh, I do like watching the Olympics. Even If you're an Olympic fan, you, this might still stretch your memory. But does anybody remember what happened in the 2008 Olympics? Those are the ones who were in China. Anybody remember at the 2008 Olympics what happened to the 4 by 100 relay teams? The the four the quarter mile the 4 by 100 relay teams. Anybody remember? Both the men's team and the women's team dropped the baton, literally. Both. I mean, both the American teams were favored to place well in the Olympics. America tends to have good relay teams. And, um, and both men's and women's 4 by 100s were disqualified because they dropped the baton. And <laughs> think about that for a minute. I mean, Americans tend to know at least some about the Olympics. And you know Olympic 
athletes don't get there unless they've devoted years of their lives. So you think about these runners, sprinters. Uh, you think about these sprinters who are on those relay, 4 by 100 relay teams. Um, not only how many weeks and how many months, but how many years they devoted to their sport, to their athletic event, and lost it in dropping the baton. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's heartbreaking to think about. Now, God is sovereign, and we can't control the outcome. Some, sometimes we do everything we can to pour the gospel into our kids, and they're still not converted, at least not at this point. But in the Lord's normal providence, you know, we want to be pouring the gospel into our kids and our grandkids, uh, leaving the results up to a graciously sovereign God. But the point is we want to be pouring in the gospel. We're going to live in the gospel. What we're going to do in the next three nights is this. We're going to talk about how does a gospel shape parenting and grandparenting. We'll make applications in both areas now and then. But as I was processing this and praying about it and studying, I kind of shifted as I went along. And I thought maybe a good way to do it is this. Why don't we take one night and talk about declaring the gospel using words. Okay, so how do we talk to our kids? How do we talk to our grandkids? How do we declare the gospel? Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about demonstrating the gospel. And this is, this is the one that I hope starts opening up doors in our understanding, is how do we demonstrate the gospel? How do we live with our kids and grandkids in a way that we're, in a sense, living out the gospel so that they see its effects? They see it how the gospel's shaping us as mom, as dad, as, as grandpa, as grandma. Uh, they're seeing that. By the way, those go very much together. Declaring the gospel and demonstrating the gospel go hand in hand. And then Friday evening, we're going we're gonna to wade into some deep water. And we're going to talk about how do you call the next generation to die for the gospel. And that might seem like a really weird thing to talk about. But how do you challenge the next generation to be willing to die for the gospel? That you influence your kids and grandkids in a way that they see that Christ and his gospel are worth more than anything this world has to offer. Christ and his gospel are worth more than everything this world has to offer. I'm willing to live and even if called upon to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do you do that? How do you call on your kids? Call on your kids to be willing to, to die for Christ, to die for the gospel. It's a very sobering subject. And yet, just to give you a... lead Paul to talk to his son that way and say, come suffer with me for the cause of Christ. We want to talk about that. We want to talk maybe in ways we've never talked about before, about how we are impacting the coming generation, kids and grandkids, with the gospel in a way that by God's grace, they would want to not only live for Christ, but if needed, to die for Christ. So those are the three evenings, declaring the gospel, demonstrating the gospel, and dying for the gospel. So tonight we're going to talk about declaring the gospel. How do we talk about it? Uh, Psalm 78. Let's spend some time in Psalm 78. I came within an inch of going to Psalm 145. You know, there's so many psalms that are intergenerational, and uh, it's hard to pick, so maybe we'll go through more than one. And as we read Psalm 78, um, I want us to especially think of it as a means of learning more how to parent our kids or grandparent our kids. And uh, it's a really long psalm. In fact, 
Psalm 78 is the second longest psalm. The longest psalm would be 119. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm by far. But it's interesting, the second longest psalm, psalm is psalm... It's been a long day already. Psalm 78. <laughs> We're not going to be able to cover it all, but we will cover parts of it. Uh, let me just read a couple of verses and then stop. Uh, the Word of God says, A mascal of Asaph, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we heard and we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Okay, let me just pause there for a minute. The song, Psalms were songs. I keep trying to say songs. The Psalms were songs. The, the Psalms were the hymn book of the Israelites. And um, so if you were a Jewish child uh, growing up in the Old Testament era, or at least part of the Old Testament era, you would have grown up singing these. These would have been the worship songs you grew up with. You know, this would be their amazing grace. You know, everybody knows amazing grace. Well, they all knew this song or that song because they grew up singing them. A lot of the Psalms are or vertical, aren't they? You know, I praise you, O oh God. You know, it's definitely going upward. And so they were written as poems that could be sung uh, individually or sung as a group in worship. But some of the Psalms are more horizontal. And Psalm 78 is one of those. Or it's not so much talking directly to God as it is talking to God's people about God. And so here it is. He 